Hi, I'm Hugh Wilkins, and I wanted to present uh, sec to sec. <coughs> so, trying different experiments on how to present, what to present, and um, what uh, level you get, and so on. So, uh, this time I'm going to use some slides. So, previously I've just kind of like written code from scratch, which has good and bad points. But here I'm just going, I'm going to use some actual slides. Uh, so, yeah, sec to sec. Uh, okay, probably this one. Okay, so the concept of sec to sec is we're going to use it for translating sentences from one language into another. Uh, it probably has a bunch of use cases, but this is the use case that uh, is used in the paper, uh, which I should probably reference. Mm, uh, yeah, and um, it's also the use case I'm going to use here. So. We have some sentence, like maybe some French, like je t'aime, and we want to translate that into maybe some English, like I love you. All right, so if we're looking at word level, uh, actually I'm going to use child level here, but anyway, uh, like if we consider word level here, uh, so the number of words might be different. So here, if you take tem as one single word, which is debatable, but uh, then we've got two words here, we've got je and tem. But in English, we have I love you, three words, right? The order of the words might be different. So if we take... Um, uh, to and M as two different words now, uh, then the, the, the to is you, right, and the M is love, and we have first we have you, and then we have love, but in English we have first we have love, then we have you, and the sentences, sentence lengths might not be standardized, so you're going to have a bunch of different sentences in French or English, and they're all going to have different lengths. Uh, so um, many techniques would expect or require that the input lengths are similar. Uh, so how to handle that? So set to set handles that. So the concept is we're going to embed the source sentence into a fixed length vector using an RNM and then using a second RNM, which is, so this is the encoder, this is the decoder. Using a decoder RNM, we're going to generate the target sentence uh, from our embedded source sentence. And the embedding of the source sentence is the internal state of the RNN at the end of uh, reading the source sentence. So here we've got a kind of a diagram of this. Uh, so these are the RNN internal states. So I'm going to assume that you know what an RNN is for this. Uh, you just don't know what the set, 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 set model is. So we've got an RNN here. Here are the hidden states. So this is kind of the empty initial state then I'm showing a char level here, right? So we put, we take each of these letters coming in as input, um, and each time we step through the RNN, uh, we're going to update this internal state. Right now, this could be an R, this could be like just a basic RNN. We'd probably use an LSTM or a GIU because those are kind of hot right now. They work quite well. Uh, a few years later, we might just use some other one. But anyway, all of these will learn to some extent and have some good or bad points. So we take in the previous state, we take in the next input, and we update the internal state. Uh, so the RNN has to learn to update its state in a way that it can. We're going to that it can basically predict the next character and so on. Then we take the internal state after it's read in all of the input words or letters, and that is basically the embedding of our source sentence. Right then, given that embedding. We're going to use the decode RNM, which is probably a different RNM, uh, to generate the output target sentence. Okay, so what we do is we use the final state of the encoder RNM as the initial state of the decode RNM. All right, then we're going to get it to predict the next character, and hopefully it's going to predict the next character based on the initial embedding state and it's going to generate a sentence that hopefully matches the input sentence. So the encoder and the decoder are probably each different models. Well, the, the weights will be different. So like one of them might be for French, for example. Uh, so it's going to embed the, the concepts of this word. It's going to uh, embed it in uh, for, assuming this is French and then the decoder is going to uh, generate from that concept two characters or words um, in English. Uh, and we're going we're to train this end to end. 
Uh, so we simply uh, feed in the uh, like the French sentence. Um, I get it to generate the output sentence and um, back propagate on that. Cool. Okay. Uh, all right, so I wrote some PyTorch code to do this. Uh, so it's just some code. Uh, there's lots of other code around, but I, I kind of did this to practice, right? Uh, to learn a bit of PyTorch. So this code, so I wanted it to learn really quickly. I didn't want to spend days training. I just wanted to be able to run it on my Mac in a couple of minutes or so. So I'm keeping it really simple. So I'm using really tiny toy data, just 16 pairs of sentences. Right, so that's enough to check that things are working. Uh, but obviously, we're not going to train a super Google Translate model or whatever. Uh, but it is enough to check that things are working. Uh, I'm using a simple RNN, not an LSTM. So why is that? Because I'm targeting do, using ex attention, um, experimenting with attention. Now, in this presentation, I'm not using attention at all, uh, although I'm running it from a directory called attention, uh, but I'm not using attention here. But I'm using the RNN because the RNN is probably going to only be able to um, consider fairly short sequences uh, in its training, uh, which is going to make the effect of using attention later more obvious. Uh, I've got one layer, 256 neurons. So one layer, just to keep it simple and fast, 256 neurons is because I tried different numbers and that kind of worked okay. Uh, I'm truncating sentences to 10 characters. That's number one to make it train quickly. And number two, because we're using this RNN, anything more than 10 characters kind of has uh, vanishing gradients and stuff, right? Uh, and I'm doing char level because I like char level because uh, it doesn't have any feature engineering, which I see as having two good points. One, it makes the code easier. And two, uh, I am um, a uh, fan of not doing feature engineering. Like one of the major advances of the um, of the AlexNet was it threw away all of the sift and sir feature engineering, and uh, it didn't have any feature engineering. The, the network learned to do it itself in an end-to-end -end fashion. Uh, oops, I've somehow skipped to the next slide. Haha. <laughs> uh, yeah, ignore that one. Uh, right, so let's have a look at this code. Well, so let's run the code and see what happens. So I'm just going to run it. Well, no, let's, I don't know, actually. Uh, so, yeah, let's run it. So um, this is actually stored on Git, and I will provide a link to this uh, in the YouTube uh, blurb. Right, so let's kind of scroll up a bit. Right, so here are the 16 sentences from input. Uh, so I got this data from, so actually there's a demo in, um, in PyTorch somewhere. Oh, here we are, right? If you go to the PyTorch, there's a sector sec demo. And uh, this guy, Sean Robertson, uh, he provides a link to some cool data uh, down here in loading data files, right? Uh, so this Anki. Uh, manythings.org, Anki has uh, pairs of languages, so that's really cool. Uh, so I'm using the French-English one, and then I'm basically just picking the first 16 pairs for speed, right? So we've got I'm glad, we're, and I'm also truncating to 10 characters. So we've got I'm glad, we're, and then you just suis happy, but we've truncated the V. Uh, when did you, and then it should be can't add. Uh, all right, so we've got these 60 sentences. They're all, these are all fairly different, and these are all fairly different. So it should be fairly obvious if it's um, managing to uh, generate the target sentence based on the source, or it's just ignoring the source and generating something that looks French, uh, and so on, right? Vocab size 43. So we've got 43 different sentences. Uh, that's because we've got like lowercase, uppercase, a few accents and stuff around, right? Uh, but a cool thing about the chai level is that we're not going to have more than, like, I mean, even with the really big data, we're still going to have more than a, a couple of hundred characters, probably, especially if we, like, uh, fold everything into ASCII. Uh, okay, and, yeah. 
and then epoch zero, so right, and then I'm printing the output in from both the encoder and the decoder separately. Uh, so I did that because it actually took a while to get this train. Uh, and um, I found that the encoder wasn't really training, it was just producing junk. And then if the encoder is producing junk, the decoder is not going to do very well. So obviously if I was sending in like millions and millions of these sentences and training for weeks, uh, maybe the encoder would eventually be able to learn from the feeble gradient coming back from the decoder. Uh, but I didn't. I wanted something to train quickly. So anyway, so here's the encoder. So to start with, uh, I'm glad becomes garbage, and all of these things become garbage. Uh, I'm feeding star and end tokens in for these. Uh, this is explained a bit in uh, Sean Robinson's uh, tutorial. Uh, so I found that, well, anyway, I'll talk about it. But anyway, so the end is just because everything has an end token, right? Right. So this is the encoder. So we're getting out junk. And then the decoder, uh, so this is just restating the uh, target, the input and the target. So this is not actually anything coming out. These, this is not coming out of the network. This is the target we're going to train against. And then this is what's actually coming out of the decoder. So we've got a, an E circumflex and a J. So uh, completely wrong in every way. Uh, for the decoder, basically, I stopped. Uh, as soon as it gets anything wrong. So it got the first character wrong, so I stopped. Uh, I found that was much easier to, um, for me to read. And then after two epochs, okay, so the encoder is actually starting to get something that looks a little bit like the source, so that's good. So we've got, uh, so the, it, it obviously it can't know what the first letter is, so it just picks the most common first letter. And then after that, we're kind of teacher forcing it, right? So it gradually realizes, that, okay, this should be W because we had he space and uh, it kind of starts getting here and uh, and cool the decoder is starting to get some stuff out but it's got like the same letter for each so that's not a good sign uh, and then after a bit uh, so the encoder is doing fairly well and the decoder has at least managed to get the correct starting word uh, based on the output of the encoder and the correct first couple of letters based on the decoder, so that's after eight, eight, eight epochs. It's okay. Uh, if we train it for a bit longer, well, I guess we could train it for a bit longer, right? Um, it will basically improve somewhat, uh, but the decoder never produces very long correct sentences, just like a few letters and stuff. Uh, probably if it's using an STM, it would get a bit further. Uh, but what I really like is, so at least it's generating some French stuff, even if it doesn't get very far, and also like it's generating the correct French thing corresponding to the encoder, right? Uh, that took a lot of effort. Uh, yeah, so I kind of have a log which maybe I should save up to get if I haven't. Of various different things I tried, uh, and it took a while to get it to produce stuff that wasn't junk. Like here's some earlier junk. Like it's it's completely ignoring the encoder, but there again, that's because the encoder is producing junk, right? Uh, more junky stuff. Sometimes I found that uh, the encoder would initially produce okay stuff, and then it would start producing junk. Anyway, I'll talk about that. Oh, I forgot to put it in the slide, but anyway, right. So here's the code. Uh, so it's in Git. Um, so I'll just kind of go through it quickly. So, so it's written in PyTorch. So this says we only want 16 sentences. If you change it, it'll pick what, however many sentences you want. Uh, this wraps getting the data from Anki for the French English. Uh, it's very easy to customize it to get, I don't know, like German English or whatever. Um, yeah, so this just gets the data. Uh, this is going to, uh, what is this going to do? Uh, this truncates the data, right? Uh, encodes it. So we've got this little module called encoding, uh, which is going to take, which is kind of, it's also in the repo, and it basically just takes the uh, ASCII characters and converts those into numbers. And then we start doing some PyTorch stuff. So first we're going to do the, the seed so that we always get the same uh, result each time, uh, which might not be a good thing, but it's a good thing for demos. Um, so we're going to create an embedding. Um, so this is the number of characters uh, that we're feeding in, and then this converts it to the hidden size. 
which is then ready to feeding into the RNN. So I'm going to assume, rightly or wrongly, that either you've used the RNN in Torch before, or you've uh, looked at some of my other videos uh, where I do things like feed random tensors through an RNN. Uh, so I'm not really explaining this uh, very much. Uh, I'm not sure how much I'm going to explain it. But anyway, so we create an RNN. Uh, the, the input size and the hidden size are both set to hidden size, which is 256 neurons in this case, single layer, tanho linearity, got bias. So the embedding converts from the vocab size to the hidden size. The RNN just uses the hidden size. We've got two RNNs, right? We've got this is the encoder, uh, this is the decoder. They both look identical. Uh, they're based, both based off the same vocabulary because we're using letters, and French and English letters are pretty much similar. Uh, so we're, using, we're going to use the same embedding for both. Uh, if we were going from, like, I don't know, English to Chinese, we would probably not use the same embedding, but here, because English and French share so many characters, so we just use the same embedding. Uh, using Adam optimizer, so optim.adam, uh, collect all the parameters, feed those to the, to the optimizer constructor. Uh, right, while loop. Uh, right, so a lot of this kind of follows the uh, some of the things in the uh, sector sec tutorial that um, Sean Robertson wrote. Uh, so you'll see a lot of similarities, so you can kind of look through them. Uh, so, for example, I'm using this teacher forcing thing. Um, yeah, so and this also kind of looks a lot like char, char RNN from um, Carp Havy. So, is there anything that's uh, strange here? I think it's all kind of standard. So, I mean, we, we'd, I'm just kind of going through each letter um, one by one, and then that lets me like print out the sentence. So, I'm not doing any batching or anything clever. I'm just doing like character by character, uh, and just one example at a time, uh, really stupidly. So, it'll probably run really slowly, but whatever. Um, Yes, and then I guess like all of the code, like there's a, there's a there's an earlier YouTube I made where I kind of actually just trained an RNN to predict integers. I think it's fine, right? And then challenges I faced, right? So I don't know if I've documented all of those. I kind of documented many. Uh, something else that I put, something else that I didn't put in here. So uh, encoder started well then produced junk right and then so what I did is I added gradient clipping which is fairly standard yes so let's change that to I don't know 14 or something yeah all right so uh, things that I found with this simple network are, are, which probably wouldn't apply if I was using like more than 16 examples. I'm training for more than like 30 seconds, but I wanted to have something I can train with 16 examples in 30 seconds. Uh, I found the encoder didn't learn quickly or at all. I mean, I found it didn't learn at all, but it might just be it didn't learn quickly. Uh, it probably just is it didn't learn quickly. So it was basically just producing a whole bunch of junk all the time, and the um, because the training signal was just coming from the decoder, and the decoder was like just doing junk. So the encoder was, I think this is from later, uh, but I was uh, the encoder was just producing lots of junk. So basically, to fix that, I added teacher forcing to the encoder. Okay, so if we look at the code, um, uh, I'm making, I'm adding loss. For, this is the encoder bit, right? We've got the encoder bit first, and then we've got the decoder bit down here. Uh, so the encoder bit is kind of like line 108 and so on. And I, somewhere I've got a loss, and gloss. Oh, loss, encode, gloss, loss. Should be getting a loss from somewhere. Prediction. Oh, right here. Right, so I'm doing encoding loss plus equal criterion, blah, 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 blah. Turning the encoding loss. And then I'm adding the result of encode, which is the encoding loss. I'm adding that to the loss, right? So the loss is the sum of the kind of teacher forcing loss on the encoder plus whatever loss we're getting on the decoder, right? And that meant that the encoder learned its language model much, much faster. 
so that's probably a variation compared to the standard thing, but that helped for, the, for this to work. Uh, right, the encoder started well, but then it started to produce junk. So like, uh, after I added the teacher force into the encoder, it would start um, learning. It would have a decent, an okay-ish language model after 10, 20 epochs, but after 50 epochs, it would just start producing junk. Uh, so I decided that was probably because the gradients were exploding. So I didn't check that, but I added gradient clipping, and then it stopped producing junk, and it was okay. Uh, so the gradient clipping is here, right? Torch.nn.utils clip gradient normal, and we just pass in the parameters. And I use 4.0, which is what fuck up either used. Uh, some other guys have used like 0 0.1. Uh, where I think as long as it's not too high, not too low, well, that's obvious, right? But I think it's probably fairly, uh, it's not too important, the exact value, but there should be some gradient clipping, otherwise they explode and everything goes to chaos. Uh, so that fixed the encoder starting well and then producing junk. I found the link between the encoder and decoder is pretty brittle. Now, I want it to be brittle because I want to use attention to show that, that fixes that. Uh, but anyway, some contributing factors to that I think partly because I'm using the RNN, not an LSTM, so I'm doing that on purpose exactly to exacerbate this issue. Uh, but I did do some things to, to mitigate this. I've reduced the sanction things to 10, uh, so um, that just means like the gradients are not going to be vanishing or exploding quite so quickly, right? Um, so yeah, attention will probably fix this. And I used the random teacher training switch that um, Sean used in his tutorial. Uh, I used that and I think that helped. So what is this switch? So basically when we're doing the decoding, um, the decoding is going to predict the next letter each time. Right, then the decoded letter is an input for generating the next letter. Right, so actually I'm not really showing it on this diagram. But the decoder works in the same way as the encoder, except that um, so each of these letters is actually input to the next time step. So I should have like, there should be like some additional kind of arrows here, really. I should probably have something like this, except in the right place. Right, and that's for each letter. Right, so it should be something like that. Oops. Yeah, so basically the decoder, based on the current state, generates a letter. Then that letter is going to be the input for the next uh, time step along with the updated state, and it's going to generate a new letter. Right, so the question is what letter are we going to use here? So if we use the generated letters, uh, if it makes any mistakes, everything else just goes uh, to junk. Uh, so what we can do is we can use something called, what, which I, I guess this is a standard phrase anyway, Sean is calling it teacher forcing. Uh, so basically, um, instead of using the predicted letter as the input to each time step, we know what the letter really should be, so we use that. So that's going to make it generate much better sentences. It's going to make it learn the language model quickly. Uh, but it means that the penalty for generating a correct, uh, well, the penalty for basically ignoring the encoder decoder link is trivial. So if we switch between teacher forcing randomly, sometimes teacher forcing, sometimes not, uh, then if it doesn't learn the link here, and it's just going to generate like, lots of junk and get a really strong penalty. So we kind of want both. We want some teacher forcing so it can learn a decent language model, and we want sometimes no teacher forcing so that it has to learn to actually pay attention to what the encoder is producing. Uh, so that's just in, in, implemented in the exact same way that Sean is doing it. So we basically just got, like, we just, uh, well, actually, no, I'm doing it like, uh, I do, because uh, it makes it easier to print the debug. Uh, I do one epoch with teacher forcing on, one epoch with teacher forcing off. So it's 50%, but it's not random. Uh, it's, it's systematically one and one. Uh, so that's what this does. And then according to the value of teacher forcing, uh, it's going to choose either the target character as the input to the next time step, 
or it's going to use the predicted character, which comes from here, right, uh, as the input to the next time step. Uh, yeah, so using that meant that the Yeah, so using that, basically, with teacher, when the teacher forcing is on, that makes the decoder learn the language model in the same way the encoder is a learning language model. And when it's off, that forces it to make the link. Right, now let's run it again just to have a look at what, uh, what we get out. Um, so how does it do? So the encoder learns fairly well uh, after a bit. Um, then the decoder. So these, these I'm only printing with teacher forcing off, right? Which is why I have this like percent print every. So that every time it's printing, it's it's got teacher forcing off. That just makes it more uh, efficient. Um, so after a while, the encoder learns its language model. If the encoders, once the encoder stabilized, then the decoder can be fairly stabilized. And we can see it gets the first couple of words correct. Well, the first couple of letters of this one correct. So uh, what I really want is that the link between the encoder and the decoder is correct. So this shows that it is correct, right? And then here it's going a bit further. Obviously, if we trained it on more data for longer using LSTM instead of an RNN, uh, we could get it to be a bit longer. It probably still wouldn't be like really long on char level. Uh, but it's okay. Right, and then what I'm hoping in future video is that uh, adding attention to this is going to fix this. Cool. Uh, so anyway, so the code for this is in GitHub. I'm going to put the link on the YouTube video. And this, the experimental log is, I will make sure it's on GitHub too. And uh, the presentation, I will provide a link to the presentation on GitHub too. Cool. Thank you very much.